Well, good morning, church. My name is Andy Maddock. I'm lead pastor here at Valencia United Methodist Church, and this is a series and season of gratitude. We've looked at our people, our past, our present, and we look ahead to our future today in a conversation about how God is at work in the days that lay ahead for us as the body of Christ. But on this day, it is good to be with you. Each of my sermon notes have invited us to take a look around uh, because it started with us being in the hall in a very different space and thinking of our history and then our common work in our past. And, and uh, so much the same today as we take a look around, things are different. Just by virtue of where the light falls during this worship service in daylight saving time, we're living into a future and a new day and things are always different. But observation is an opportunity for gratitude in what we see from what has changed and in newness to give thanks. For what remains the same and for stability to give thanks. For that which has previously been unknown to give thanks and that of which we are certain to give thanks. Join me in a moment of prayer. Holy God in whom we live and move and have our being, we give you good thanks for this day, for the saints of our lives and our faith and those who remember this morning and for the opportunity to be your people gathered. Bless us in this time, in Jesus' name, amen. Today we turn our attention to our future, and in that spirit, I want to take just a quick moment and share some of my joy and excitement about our future as United Methodists here in this place. This last week, juris, members of our jurisdiction uh, met, lay people and clergy, to prayerfully decide and discern on who will be new bishops to serve us in this area in the coming quadrennium. We elected three new bishops for the area, uh, and I just want to introduce them to you. First, on the far right is Reverend Carlo. Uh, he comes formally as the district superintendent from the Alaska area, and the 1st of January will be serving the Desert Southwest Annual Conference. Phoenix area is his seat, serves Las Vegas as well. In the middle is our new bishop coming from Paradise Valley United Methodist Church, largest church in the Phoenix area, uh, to serve as our bishop the 1st of January is the Reverend Dottie Escobedo Frank, and we are so thrilled to have her. And on the other end is a dear friend of mine, I've known him for 24 years, uh, the Reverend Dr. Cedric Bridgeforth. Uh, I'm pumped because he's a fellow AIDS life cyclist, and we get out and ride together. If you've never ridden with a bishop, it's a good, good thing. I want to share a thought about the future that uh, and who we are as a church that Cedric wrote that just struck me. Comes from his book, Alabama Grandson, a personal memoir. He said, I embraced all of who I am because of the church of my youth and my adulthood, and it taught me that I was created the image of likeness of God. Those same churches taught me that God is love, which led me to believe and to now teach that if we are made in the image and likeness of God, then I am love, and I am to give love, and I am worthy of love. I embraced love, and love has embraced me, and now I long for the church to come around to love's way of being. I give God thanks for Carlo, for Cedric, for Dottie, faithful pastors for the whole of their lives and career who now serve as Episcopal leaders in our midst, and for Reverend Dottie Escobedo Frank in particular, as she comes to serve as my bishop and yours with the first of the year. I am grateful for their future work. Today is also All Saints Sunday. For looking ahead to the future, we in some ways reach back to the legacy of our past, knowing that each of these lights represents a loved one from your midst and your story. And their light burns bright on this morning, not because we have lost them, but because we have loved them and been loved by them. Our world is indeed brighter for the saints who have gone before us. And I'll speak on behalf of at least one of the lights on this altar table this morning. I know that that individual's gratitude for this church's future has allowed us to do much of the work that you've seen happen on our campus in my time here. From termite, or for, for termite tenting and the work in the flooring in the office and the work that we've done in here and so many of the other projects that we've been a part of, it was one individual's gift to us in their passing their legacy gift, their identity that says, I give thanks for this work and this church into its future, even as my present comes to a close that allows us to be who we are and to accomplish what we are doing today. And I'm grateful for that person. But I have a question for us on this grateful Sunday. How do you see the future? Now, I've made film references before, and the simple truth is, is that we live in a back to the future society. We are now living into the world that Michael J. Fox and Christopher Lloyd anticipated in their 1985 film. This is the world that they imagined. 
In fact, we're past that. Because when they traveled into the future, they only went to 2015. I don't have a flying car. I don't even have shoes that tie themselves. The world is different than we sometimes anticipate in our past about the future. There's some great articles from the turn of the last century, 1900s, imagining what the world would be like in the year 2000. Some of the things they got right, some of the things they imagined is that we would talk face to face over great distances in the way that we now FaceTime or Zoom with one another. And then some things we just haven't still gotten right. A childhood from my youth and maybe yours was meet the Jetsons, right? George Jetson would have been born this year to be 45 in the year that that show is set. So imagine 45 years from now, we'll all have our flying cars and our pretentious teenagers and our robot maids, right? All of that will be in place. Fingers crossed. How do you see the future? I'm going to give you four answers from the life of the church as I've seen it play out. One possible answer for the future is uncertainty and worry. And I think this is the model that the world suggests, particularly the 24-hour news cycle. When you have to fill that much time talking about what the world holds, you live from a place of fear. Because you can't possibly have all of the answers that you or anyone else needs. And so if the future is something that is unknown and confusing and scary, and it puts you at risk, one of the ways to lean into the future is from a place of uncertainty and worry. To chicken little your way into the future and to say, well, the sky hasn't fallen yet, but I think that it might, and it could happen any day and to allow that fear to drive you and to diminish you in your experience and expression of the world. The second is to confess that the future is unknown, but it is assured. I am with you always, even to the end of the age, says Jesus Christ. To lean into the confession of Romans that says nothing, not princes, not leaders, not the brokenness of the church or home, not life or death. Nothing is going to separate you from the love of God in Christ Jesus. So while the future may not be known to you, you can rest in assurance. What I have in mind is what our founder, John Wesley, experienced from German Christians called the Moravians. On a boat ride to the Americas, where he served as a missionary to the colony of Georgia, by the way, he was caught up in a terrible storm. Boat was tossing. He thought he was going to be swallowed by what he called the great beast of the sea. He had been watching for weeks now a group of German Christians on the boat, and in the midst of the storm, he wanted to go and test them. He confesses this in his journal. He says, Throughout this process, I have seen these people not be given over to pride or to anger or even to revenge. But I imagine that in a condition like this, they would be given over to fear. He goes down into the belly of the boat, and he goes to the door of the German Moravians, and instead of fear and terror, he hears hymns sung in German. And so he asks the men, were you not afraid? No, certainly we were not. What about the women and the children? Certainly they were afraid. No, for their assurance rests in the Lord. They told Wesley that no matter the fear they faced, the uncertainty they faced, God was with them. And if they died that day or a hundred days or a hundred years from that day, God would still be with them. A third way to look at the future of optimism and potential. To live into a spirit of hope. One, yes, that God is present and assuring, but also to lean into what writers of science fiction and fantasy have done for a long time. What science has hopefully taught us, that there are new medicines and new ways of being, new technologies that are helping us to live longer and more healthy lives, maybe there's a reason to say humanity has great potential. There's a hope here. And so as I look into the future, as I see the future, I see it with optimism that our potential for good, our potential for love, our potential for compassion can outweigh the risk of avarice. And hatred. <clears throat> so another way to look at it is to say that the future is a good thing because all things are working for good in the trajectory of humanity. The fourth way that I've seen the church kind of live into things is one is to say that the future is inevitable. It's going to happen. And so we must be prepared. Even this week in your newspapers, if you had not seen it, 
that Los Angeles County Fire Department encouraged the people of our valley, the Santa Clarita Valley, to go over your family emergency preparation plan. Do you know where water, resources, batteries, flashlights, candles, the things you might need if there was an incident? Fill in the gap. A quake like the Northridge one in 94. A train derailment. Something that cuts us off. A big fire. Whatever the case might be. Are you prepared to handle what is unknown about the future? Now, you might not do that in such a way as to say, I'm being prophetic about it. And I know that that storm is coming tomorrow, or I know that the earthquake is coming in three days, but to say, I'm ready to face no matter what happens. Sometimes we can talk about the future as being inevitable, but that by God's grace, we are prepared. So the church lives into all four of these in some ways or another. A part of the way we hope to address our uncertainty about the future, that which is unknown, is to claim the idea that a God that we know is present in this story and working for us. We take an optimism that is rooted in the work of the love of Christ and the gospel and overlay it into our hope and expectation. And we say that no matter what happens, the inevitability of it, we will be prepared. It's a reason we take offerings. It's the reason we do a stewardship campaign to say we don't know what 2023 will hold, but we live into a sense of optimism that there will be work for the church to do there. And so let's be prepared financially to do it. So in light of all of that future talk, let's look at the passage for this morning. It comes from Paul's letter to the Philippians, chapter 4. I've been reading these uh, Pauline letters throughout this series. Most of the readings have been introductions, kind of a welcome uh, opening paragraph. This is one that closes out the letter to the book of Philippians, and it's giving thanks for their gifts and generosity, and I'm going to share it with you this morning. I rejoice greatly in the Lord that at last you renewed your concern for me. Indeed, you were concerned but had no opportunity to show it. I am not saying this because I am in need, for I have learned to be content with whatever the circumstances. I know what it is to be in need. I know what it is to have plenty. I've learned the secret of being content in every situation, whether well-fed or hungry, whether living in plenty or in want. I can do all this through him who gives me strength. 413 is the favorite of many. I have it on a ring in my home. I can do all things through Christ Jesus who gives me strength. But it continues. Yet it was good of you to share in my trouble. Moreover, as the Philippians know, in the early days of your acquaintance with the gospel, when I set out for Macedonia, not a single church shared with me in the matter of giving and receiving, except for only you. For when I was in Thessalonica, you sent me aid more than once when I was in need. Not that I desire your gifts. What I desire is that more be credited to your account. I received full payment, and I have more than enough. I am amply supplied. Now that I've received from Aphrodite the gifts you've sent, they are a fragrant offering, an acceptable sacrifice pleasing to God. And my God will meet all your needs according to the riches of his glory in Christ Jesus. To our God and Father be glory forever and ever. Amen. The word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. <coughs> in this final week with Paul, in talking about this letter to the Philippians, we acknowledge that this was written when Paul was in prison. And he's living into a time of struggle, and in the midst of his witness to the Philippians, he finds himself contented by the strength of Christ. That in the midst of the early church, there was this want and desire to share with those who were in need, and Paul says, don't think of me as your spiritual leader, as the one who is asking. I'm not in need. I've had plenty. I've had nothing. I know what it means to be well-fed. I know what it means to be hungry. No, your gifts are for another and beyond me. What I want to add to is the measure and the amplitude of your perception. Because generosity is the pattern of the fruits of Philippi. They are a people who were generous when no other church was, and they are a people who continued in their generosity even when it wasn't needed or extraordinary. They just knew they had something to give. And the language that Paul chooses to use with this church in Philippi goes back to an image of the Old Testament. Did you hear him say that? Your offering is an acceptable and fragrant one to God. 
It makes God's nostrils happy. Here's the image in the early, early Jewish church. When animals are offered in sacrifice upon flames at the altar, they send to heaven a smoke that's not unlike good barbecue. And it is a smell that is pleasing to God. We see images of this throughout the Old Testament. That when Cain and Abel come and make their offering, there is one that smells of cooked meat that is acceptable to the Father. That when they make an offering uh, after the Noah's family is brought off the ark, they sacrifice one of the animals and it becomes a fragrant offering acceptable to God. When priests are established in Exodus, they are set up by making offerings of the ram that is a smell acceptable to God. The altar in Leviticus is one such that it is a fragrance that is pleasing to the Lord. Paul expands on that idea and says any giving that you give, not even the barbecue style offering, but how you live your life and your heart becomes the fragrance that makes God happy. It makes God pleased with how you are living your lives and how you are expressing your faith. That's the reason for generosity, says Paul. And it is always shared with others. Not just those at the top. It is an anticipatory work. It says, I know that I have enough and I will have my needs met. So help me, O oh God, to meet the needs of another. Because generosity is a means by which we give thanks for our future. Whether we live into flying cars and robot butlers, or DeLoreans that travel through time, or just another day of God's good work here on this corner, generosity serves as thanks that is given in the hope of the expectation for a future where God is. We wouldn't pass the offering plates or take stewardship cards from you if we did not anticipate that God's good work would continue in the coming year. And so as we give thanks for what God will do, it serves as an opportunity for honor what God has done in our past, what God has done, what God is doing in our day today, and what God will do in our future. Whether it's 15 minutes from now out over donuts, 10 days from now in the work of the new season of Advent in this church, 10 years from now in our common work together for transforming the world, that the generosity that we sow today anticipates God's coming work. So that's why on All Saints Sunday, my letter invited you to bring back your stewardship cards. To say that there will somehow be a connection between our past, our present, and an opportunity to sow our stewardship into today. That out of the abundance of the gifts that we offer as first fruits at any time in the seasons of our life, we do so knowing that God is not just being honored by what God has done and the people that God has shared with us in these lights and in these candles. But in those saints and those lights and those lives that we will come to know in this coming year. And so our stewardship ties in with our table fellowship, the gift of communion in our midst. Communion is gratitude for past, for present, and for future. It celebrates a historical item, the Last Supper of Jesus and the First Communion of the Church. But it tells a story that is present in the now. You're going to see me break the bread in a moment's time. And it anticipates the work of the future. The Communion Act is always celebrated around what we call a great thanksgiving or the Eucharist. That's what the Eucharist means. This great thanksgiving gives thanks to a Trinitarian God, a Father, a Son, and the Holy Spirit. A father who is at work in creative ways in the full of, fullness of creation as a living parent, a loving parent in our midst. And you'll hear in the words of Camille's liturgy today that the language emphasizes that God is a God of all of the saints. The saints of the Old and the New Testament and the saints of our mothers and our fathers, our siblings and our children on through the generations. That same creative energy is that move in our past and in our future. And then... There is a spirit of thanksgiving for the work of the Son in the present. The work of Jesus Christ, who in the living of his life in his day, broke bread with sinners, healed the sick, opened the eyes of the blind, and then lived into the future that we are growing into in the birth of the church. But it always ends with a prayer of anticipation. Pour out your spirit on these gifts that we might be the body of Christ going out to serve 
the world together. Communion is this intersection where we are given the chance to remember who we are and whose we are in remembering and calling to mind what it literally means in the word is to put pieces together. The members are brought together again as if we are building a puzzle or restoring that which is torn apart or broken or lost. We are putting together the narrative of God's work in our past and anticipating God's movement in our future every time we break bread and share in cup together. That's why it's a sacred and holy moment, and we call it a sacrament. Communion serves as the means to hand us off in this present moment into the future that God has prepared for us. But I don't want to put the horse before the cart or create a sense of expectation. The fact that there are baskets to receive your stewardship cards down here do not predicate the idea of you being worthy of receiving communion. Some of you pledge online, some of you forgot them, some of you aren't going to pledge, which is fine. Come anyway. Why? Because remembering in communion always first celebrates the abundant providence of God, not what we do or our readiness to receive it. So don't use not having a stewardship card as a means by which to say, I should not then come to communion today. Nor should you offer your stewardship card in the baskets as a way of saying, this is my golden ticket to God's good table. All of that came before. Before my letter to you, before you put pen to paper to decide what 2023 looked like for you and your family, before you were born, before your parents were born. God was already at work in our past anticipating this present moment and the future that we grow into as the body of Christ. So I give thanks for our future together. All that God's going to do with the good work of Camille and myself and our family in your midst and your families as we grow in grace and hope and purpose together and we fulfill the work that God has equipped us to in this place and for his sake. Let's pray.